All right, the Lord be with you. Let's pray. Bless us, O Lord, in all our doing with your most gracious favor. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us and bring us to the glory of your salvation. Amen. Okay, well, welcome. Here we are continuing in our study of the resurrection appearances that are known as I described it as the true last words of Jesus. Um, uh, the title of the class really comes from the idea that it is often said or often remembered on Good Friday that the last words of Jesus are the ones that he spoke from the cross on Good Friday. But we know that he um, uh, spoke many words after Easter morning um, in that season that we call um, Easter Tide from the resurrection until ascent, the ascension, celebration of the ascension. Um, and so um, we're taking a look at those interactions that Jesus had um, in that time. Um, it just so happens that they, they, they tend to follow what we're reading in church on Sunday. So today's um, gospel is, is, that, is that as well. Um, so <laughs> here's a story that I, uh, I um, picked up. I, well, let me just share it with you. I don't know if anybody remembers the, um, the syndicated columnist Robert Novak. But anyway, he wrote an autobiography. And he tells in that, in that autobiography of the spiritual experience he had when he was teaching at Syracuse University in the late 90s. He was at dinner um, uh, before he was giving a speech and he had an encounter at dinner that he describes in his book. Um, and he describes himself as having been pretty agnostic for most of his life. Um, pretty agnostic for most of his life. <laughs> And he was at dinner and he noticed somebody was wearing a cross, a woman was wearing a cross. And he asked if she was Catholic. Uh, she said she was. He asked if he was, and he said, no. He said, you know, my wife and I have been going to church, but in this way that you might, you've heard before, you know, right? Um, uh, kind of going, but maybe slightly embarrassed or not. Quite know what to say about the fact that they were going, but didn't really understand what they believed about it, right? Which, you know, many of us find us in that place. I'm not shaming anyone, but that's what he's describing in his in his um, in his uh, book. And she asked him if he was planning to join the church, and he said, "No, no, not not at this time. No, no." And she said, "This is it's interesting that this it was meaningful." But anyway, I guess she replied rather directly. She said, Mr. Novak, life is short. <laughs> and all her encounter. Get on with it. With that, get on with get it. Get on with it. When he did something, did something to him, he described. Anyway, he described it as it did something to him. And, um, after after the dinner and after he did his speech, he went back to try to find uh, this this woman, but um, he couldn't. And so he describes it as this stranger who they had never seen before, and he likely would never um, see again. Um, had this um, impact on him and his uh, spiritual life that um, uh, culminated. He describes in his um, fully joining the church and jumping in to uh, um, life with God, really, in the late, about you know, two or three years later. Um, so I find this um, uh, uh, dynamic interesting, and especially in light of the passage that we're going to, to look at 
today. But um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but um, I might ask if anybody has a, uh, not necessarily for yourself, but an, but an encounter of, of telling um, uh, the story of faith that has had an impact either on you or you think it had an impact on, on someone else. Um, uh, just some experience that has caused, maybe has caused you to see something different or see the way in which you have um, uh, looked at God, if not understood God um, differently. The experiences that anyone would want to share? I can share one. John? I was um, raised in church and tell people I was as bad a kid as you can be and be in church every week. So. <laughs> go to youth trip mission group to um, Colorado my roommate, to make it really short we were doing music and inviting people to come to a program so I and buddy were out just walking around the town inviting people to come and I don't know what happened but somehow in that encounter of inviting something, we were actually just trying to meet girls, but we <laughs> church. It was like God exploded my awareness and consciousness. And that was the turning point in my spiritual life. And I I can't explain it to this day, yeah. but it was somehow that offering just a simple invitation to others that God turned around and used to awaken my heart. Yeah. So I don't can't explain it, but yep. that's what happened. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When I was a little girl, um, my family, we were all in a car, the green Oldsmobile, I remember. And it was my mother driving, my oldest brother in the front seat, my baby sister. And then there were three of us in the back seat and there were the, the two dogs. We had two little Pomeranians. We were coming from, um, from Maine to North Carolina. And somewhere along the way, and I can't remember what state it was in, it was perfectly clear skies, beautiful weather, et cetera. And my mom lost control of the car. And the next thing I knew, I remember looking up out of the window and my, my, my brother who was sitting next to me just jumped on top of me and just pushed me down, down into the floorboard. But as I was going down, I said, we're okay. I just saw God's gonna you know, clear the way for us. And I was little whenever I said that. And then the next thing I knew was, you know, bump, 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 whoosh, we go down this bank, et cetera. And it was all over with. And when we got out, everybody had stopped. This is back whenever everybody stops for you. They, they right. just don't care. Right. And everybody stopped wondering, you know, were we all right? Of course, we were. The only thing my mother had was a scratch on her arm and all of us were fine. And when the, um, the emergency service people came, they were saying, okay, who's injured and all? We were all sitting there, no, we're not injured. After it was all over with, we looked up and I mean, the traffic was so bad and it was on interstate traffic. She had gone, she had gone through, she blew a tire is what it was. And she had gone through all four lanes wow. of traffic down an embankment. And if we'd gone like 50 feet farther, we would have really crashed down. And I just remember just being so calm and just saying, God was with us. And my mom would just look at me and I said, I just said a little prayer and God was with us. And mom just shook her head and said, you've always had that blind faith. I've never understood where it came from. And that was something that just, I've always remembered. So anytime I get into, you know, a real panic kind of thing, I try to remember that particular time of where as a little girl, I just said, God was with us. It was just wrong. Yeah. That's hard to beat, isn't it, guys? It is. Uh, yeah. 
We were Thanksgiving and we were moving our daughter in Connecticut from Virginia and we get out of the house that day, that night. And we we're moving along and it's pretty obvious there was brother and I and her husband and we were moving as best we could, but we were not going to get that van loaded. And out of the blue, a guy comes walking up, offers help. Yeah. He got done, and he disappeared. Ain't a name. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, I want to share. So, I grew up a preacher's kid, so there's lots of moments where you feel like, okay, there's those moments. Yeah. Um, but then when you remove that part of, you see those in different people's lives at lots of different times. In college, I was a music major, still sing. Well, not right now, working on my doctorate, so I'm not singing as much. But, uh, in college, the last year we were on tour in Europe. We got to sing in Notre Dame. The professor had written a piece of music, the Magnificat, set it to music, and we were singing with just the magnificent organ up front. Um, was going on, and in the in the piece, there's a part where it says "Glory to the Father." In that moment, there was nothing that could come out of my voice. It didn't matter what could happen, and it was just one of those moments of you just felt everything hit. And it wasn't a moment like I've felt any other time in my life. And so it's peace. And then to see it burn a few years later was one of those things that I got to actually sing in that space. Yeah. So it's just kind of fun. Well, let's open our Bibles. And let's turn right to the Gospel of Luke, uh, which happens to be today's um, Gospel passage. Um, chapter 24, whoever finds it, fill out the page number, 964, the page numbers are in the middle binding. Uh, let's um, read 13 
uh, through 32, 13 through 32. Would someone read for us 13 through 27, and then somebody read 28 through 32? So 13 to 27. Just raise your hand. All right. Claudia, oh, yeah. And then who's going to read 28 through um, 32? Um, Margaret. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Now on that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and good, for God and for the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he wanted to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. When they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of the angels, said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us to the tomb found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah would suffer these things and then enter into the glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself scriptures. As they came near the village which they were going, and as if you were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's all speaking, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. But he's at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it. Gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And it vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Thank you. So um, here's, a, here's something to consider. We're told in this passage, first of all, notice that the whole passage begins, uh, verse 13, now on the same day. So this is the same day of um, the women finding the tomb open without the body inside, the very same day. I, we still haven't had um, um, a real kind of understanding among Jesus' disciples of the resurrection here. Uh, and so it starts on the same day. And we notice that um, these disciples, the text tells us, was kept from recognizing him. Now, that can mean a couple of things. That can mean someone from outside of themselves kept them from recognizing Jesus. It can mean something from inside of themselves kept them from recognizing Jesus. Um, let's just sit with that for a minute. What do we, what, what might we think about this whole part of this story that is they were kept from recognizing him? 
what what reasons might there be? Yeah, Chase. I was thinking the same thing last week when Mary is sitting there with Jesus in the empty tomb uh -huh. and she doesn't recognize him, yeah. whom she knew so well. And I think it's largely that we see what we expect to see. We see what we expect to see. The expectation is so much here. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Lee. It's interesting too that because they don't recognize him, um, he's he's able to ask them, "Oh, really? Well, what what are they saying about him? <laughs> what, is, what, what things are happening? What are they, you know, what's happening?" Yeah, much sort of Socratic method, almost, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dead is dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People are trying to be comfortable thinking they know they are comfortable. Idea of love and resurrection. Yeah. Radical. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And not only soft original with me, but maybe you're getting ready to connect with the picture. No worries. Of course. They are uh they are prevented from seeing him for whatever reason. And he has a Socratic moment where he's teaching them. And then they recognize him in the breaking of bread. And so it is the gathering together of the community, the four, four shadows, the communion gathering, the church gathering. And so you, it comes together, I suppose. Uh, the pieces come into place when you are gathered in community with the breaking of the bread. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think somebody was part of the age old question, do we come to faith uh, solely of our own will? Right. Or is the interaction of the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That's so really actually the question here is I mean it's a real um um aspect. Uh, that actually foreshadows our church service as well. We have the liturgy of the word where Jesus is explaining scriptures to him. Right. And then Eucharist breaking That's right. right. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, these men were describing what uh, the women were telling them. I'm assuming one of the very reference. Yeah. The um, gentleman behind me was describing some stranger leading him to Jesus, but he just, you know, doesn't even remember his name. I mean, I'm not pretending you're anyone. We've all yeah. had encounters like that. And yet, why, why not believe? I mean, why doesn't it happen? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Margaret. 
heard the priest said we had to change the dip. It's so comforting to know that these people in the union definitely didn't know he was there, so to speak, but he was. And I thought, well, that means he's there, but I'm not recognizing him. <laughs> so Jesus is present with me, and I don't have to know. I mean, hopefully, I will. Right. But that's a, that's a very profound reflection on this passage. Okay? The presence. Yeah, this is this has been a debate in the for a long time, right? Um, is uh, does God only have power by us recognizing it and describing God? Right? Um, is that the only way God? And we don't want to go down this. We know this is not the class to go down this road too far, but. Right, uh, there are branches of Christianity that you know God has no power unless you see it and know it, and recognize it, and claim it. Right, um, that's the kind of I have decided. Right, till I decide, God has no really power in my life or in other people's lives. And then there's the other that is, you know, more of the kind of God's power is unleashed upon the world. The resurrection and I can't stop it. I can't even stop it. <laughs> right? It, that it's happening, even if I want to say, leave me alone, <laughs> go away. I can't like be back in a box. And I'm not saying it's only either or I'm just saying, you know, there there is this this aspect in this story that God has come among them. They didn't invite him. <laughs> he showed up. Um, he also didn't. He also didn't. I mean, he does say, right? One of his words of after the resurrection is, Oh, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So there's a statement from Jesus after his after his resurrection. Um, maybe that's an explanation. Um, we don't observe, though, in this story, these kind of, the kind of, like, um, philosophical interactions, like a, a philosophical engagement. Well, let's talk about this stuff. You know, let's debate this, <laughs> right? We, we just see the encounter, we see the relationship um, happen and as Ed is pointing out, you know, let's sit down and eat together, you know, is, um, which is, again, different from that type of very prevalent, um, sometimes understood as spiritual engagement in the day of a philosophical Socratic kind of engagement of debate, right? And from the debate, we may learn something, which may feel spiritual to us, but it's, um, it's mm -hmm. what we read here is still different than, than that. Yeah. You think it's referring to the Messiah is suffering in his glory. I know that in Isaiah, it's a lot well, the echo is certainly of, of those promises from the prophet Isaiah. Yeah, yeah. And one would imagine that they who choose to heard that echo of that in the future. That's my largely from Isaiah. But not only. Yeah. Yeah. You stress it. I think it's one way you can say, give me any argument for Israel. Maybe this could be even this way, but that it was a mystical or a hidden population. Best way to make it real. What he was saying. In other words, 
and the park made it clear that you get into a philosophical argument. For example, you could put me out in the park and clear those stops. I feel the president would not be safe without any question. I mean, could it be something that try to make well, that they were trying to make maybe maybe the man is just a myth that was used by the prophet. I don't mean to be heresy here or anything. But well, you get really close back. <laughs> Well, sure. I mean, I mean that could be said for the whole of literature. You don't want to go down that way, but I mean, I, 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 I you know, we have just for my sake, um, you know, these these stories have a lot of uh, believability in them. They appear at multiple locations. Um, and so I mean, I I think I don't think we have to go down that road in order to in order to sit with them and, and hear the experience of of Christ, of Christ in them. I don't know. Um let's look now, let's go a little bit past um uh verse um uh 28. Um as they came near the village going. He walked ahead um, as if he were going on. So he's about, well, it says as if. So maybe he wasn't intending to just say that I'm done with this, I'm leaving. But perhaps he, he was. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is nearly over. Um, that's a statement of hospitality. That's not a statement of, um, um, well, you might be an angel, so why don't you stay with us? <laughs> now, maybe there was hospitality among, among uh, spiritual uh, experiences, but nevertheless, that's a statement of hospitality. So he, Jesus, went and stayed with him. And then, as Ed points out, when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And as Van points out, he vanished from their sight. So this takes it out of the realm of the ordinary and places it in the realm of the extraordinary. Now we could do a whole six week class on, you know, what are, what are the scriptural references to um, the resurrection body and what does St. Paul mean about the resurrection body? What are we experiencing in the gospel sections about the resurrection body? Uh, then, you know, uh, uh, said it must have been ghosts. I mean, there's, there's lots of um, uh, very uh, powerful, not just interesting, but also spiritually deepening reflection on on what does resurrection what does christian the christian idea of resurrection look like feel like um what do we understand um about it but certainly there is something in this in between time and i think this is important for us to kind of name in this class of looking at jesus's words between the resurrection and the ascension there's something about Jesus that is, again, radical in the sense that it's not the kind of norm of what was being claimed even about resurrection in religious cults and perspectives and even among Jewish uh, 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 parties in the time because you've, you've got descriptions again and again throughout the scripture of something that is, is almost hard to grasp, right? This is not, as Amy has pointed out so well in her sermon last week, and then again, a funeral we had yesterday, that these resurrection appearances are not just 
spiritual experiences, right? This is what we hear in our modern society. I'm spiritual, but not religious, right? This, this, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm just saying that this is, this is the kind of acceptable way to be uh, religious in our culture today. Um, I'm spiritual, but not religious kind of also translates to, um, I like to sleep in on Sunday. Night. I like to sleep <laughs> in on Sunday. Night. Yes, the New York Times is much more interesting than the sermons that you. <laughs> right. Um, I get it, but yeah. Let me finish this one thought. Let me finish this one thought. Um, and um, and so, what we're what's described about Jesus's resurrection body is something different than that. It's there is something real about it. He's walking on the road. <laughs> it is a, they experience him as a human. There's nothing in the first part of the story that suggests they saw one as if a man. Someone who they encountered, they met, they spoke with, they um, and they sat down at table with and broke and ate with and then he vanished so there's there's something there that is not just the, a description that might be well the disciples really wanted to believe this took place so so it must have took a, taken place you know it was the collective oath that made it happen you know that's not what we read in the text. Um, so that's an interesting and uh, reflection for us to just notice and sit with, you know, what might that be, you know, and, and, um, and this connects, again, as Amy did so well in a homily at a funeral yesterday, with our own kind of considerations of, of the life to come, right? <laughs> as we proclaim in the um, the Episcopal liturgy um, at the opening sentences of the Episcopal liturgy for the burial of the dead is, you know, that uh, great passage from, um, I think it's Isaiah, um, I shall stand on the last day and see God, I myself shall see him and behold him, uh, not as a stranger, but as a friend, you know, this isn't uh, death, you know, our energy goes to be mixed with all of the energy of the cosmos, you know, in death. It's like God actually knows who I am, knows my name, and welcomes me um, in that place where there is no pain, grief, or sorrow. So that's a dynamic of what we're experiencing in these resurrection, um, resurrection appearances. Lori, I'm sorry. Okay, because I've heard. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're led to believe, you know, that the, the disciples maybe, maybe so this is our prayer. And let, and let us stand in the family. Okay. So they, and it's three days later, they would not have witnessed this pack of the blessings. And so it sounds much more to me like when people came in and saw how them experience and kind of this way So it always comes into pieces when time is sorted out. 
And the impact included the loop in which Paul's career decades later. After they realized this is what happened, here they were walking in the Emmaus with the Lord of the Lord. The stranger joins the conversation with God. And then lo and behold, they And they're recognizing it because by now, years, months, years later, they are familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's certainly possible. It's also possible that they told the story immediately and the story has been carried on. And Luke is retelling. Yeah, right. 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 Um, let's um I've got a bat we have baptism at 1045 today, so I'm gonna end a little bit early, but let's um let's just look next at what happens here. Um, um so he was at table, verse 30, he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and they vented from the sight. And they said each to each other, or in the King James, they said unto um, uh, one to each other, um, were our hearts, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. What do you think that means? Were our hearts not burning within us? They're talking about just a few hours earlier when they were walking on the road, they didn't recognize him. They're now describing that as a time when their hearts were burning within them. Charlie, the Pharisees couldn't believe it, walking, sitting there thinking, this sounds too familiar now, can't they? Yeah, yeah, kind of like, how, how could that be? Yeah. Or John Wesley's recounting, his heart was strangely warm. Right, yes. Yeah. I wonder if that's where John got his reference for that. Yeah. It's a really powerful description um, and I find it really compelling. I don't know totally what to make of it, but except that they're now experiencing looking back. Uh, well, let me just stop for a minute. It's possible to look back. I don't know if some of the stories we've heard today are more looking back on it, <laughs> right? I see how that moment really changed something uh, for me. Wonder if that's what it is. Uh, but that experience in my life, I now see changed either how I saw it or how I lived or whatever, whatever it might be. And I think that's a little bit of what what can happen in faith? I mean, it's the popular culture of kind of Christian conversion is that kind of, uh, it's kind of a singular moment. It's really dramatic. You know it when it's happening. And from then on, you have uh, this different life. Right? But that's not what we really see even here in the scripture. We see they didn't even know what was happening to them when it was happening. And it's after the fact, looking back upon it, that their eyes are opened. And they, I love the way they describe it, our hearts were burning within us. That's sort of what I was talking about a little bit. I, I don't understand where you put the physical and the... Uh, Philosophical or something, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. The physical maybe isn't as relevant as to the whole, whole emotion that really burning your face. Maybe I could not have it in the physical, but in just a moment, sure. 
actually that. But, but, <laughs> but I know I've experienced it myself, but I would not say that it was a grace, the internal feeling, which was maybe positive, but not something that I didn't accept. It sounds like you're describing some type of divine intervention. So, yeah. You were sitting in Hawking Chapel, and I wanted to be around me. And they're sitting on your bed. And you need to be reminded that you need to be accomplished. I don't know. And I know instantly I can. It's not in your hand. Yeah. yeah. And then let's just know how we end here. That um that same hour, I like all the descriptions of time and place. That same day, that same hour, then it was evening and the sun was going down, right? That's how I think. I think also we have a sense that this is not, this wasn't set out to be some, uh, let's give spiritual, just a spiritual meaning to something that happened, right? Um, that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Remember, we're told already that the village of Emmaus is seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't say how far they got before they encountered Jesus, but the implication is they got all the way at dinner, and then they went back to Jerusalem immediately. Well, he doesn't use the word immediately, but the, that's the implication. They found the others and their companions gathered there, and they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had made known to them, been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And then this is in the gospel text. Now we're in Luke this week, not in John, but there's a pattern here in each of the gospels that it's, it's really after the description of the women arriving at the tomb that you get the proclamation of, I have, he has risen, I have seen the Lord. And he has, and that proclamation comes in these encounters with, with Jesus after the resurrection, um, these kind of confirmations, if you will, that we are in a new, um, a different state of, of, I guess, being, you might say, but that can be complicated. Yeah, Dick, and then I'm going to. Yeah. Doesn't name the other one, but then later he said he's appeared to Simon. Right. So the implication is that's the, the other one. That's the implication. Right. That's the implication. So, so these two guys walking down the road, they're reflecting on, wow, we've been with this guy for three years and they don't really understand what he's trying to say. But I Trying to get this idea, and then here comes a person who suddenly kind of puts it all together, and they go, Yeah, I get it. <laughs> it, it it's innocent. See, they're not reflecting, I mean, at least the text says they're only reflecting the Jerusalem that week. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. They're, just, they're thinking about it. They're just kind of flooded with everything that's happening. Awesome. When it seems kind of like from Palm Sunday. Well, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.